guys, and welcome back to the Road to Success MCAT Test Prep Series. This video marks the start of a new series on my channel where I discuss the important topics you need to know about biology for the MCAT. This video is titled The Cell, and it's the most important video you will ever watch for the MCAT, as it covers about 20% of biology, which is the most important subject you need to know for the exam. This video will be discussing eukaryotic organelles, as well as prokaryotes and cellular reproduction. I will finish it off by talking about viruses. The eukaryotic organelles are obviously the most important part of the exam. So I will be starting off by talking about eukaryotic organelles, specifically the nucleus and the mitochondria. So that being said, let's jump right into it. All right, let's start off by talking about eukaryotic organelles, starting with the nucleus. The nucleus is the control center of the cell and is the most heavily tested organelle on the MCAT. It contains all the genetic material needed to replicate the cell. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear membrane, which is a double membrane that maintains a nuclear environment separate from the cytoplasm. Nuclear pores allow for selective two-way exchange of material between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. DNA is contained in coding regions called genes. Linear DNA is wound around organizing proteins known as histones. So I'll write this here. Now these histones are wound even further into chromosomes. The location of the DNA in the nucleus is what allows for the compartmentalization of DNA transcription to be separate from RNA translation. And lastly, let's talk about this area called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is uh, responsible for the synthesis of ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. It takes up about 25% of the nucleus, and it is often identified by the dark spot that you'll see. Moving on, let's talk about the mitochondria, which is the second most important uh, organelle you'll be seeing on the exam. The mitochondria has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The outer membrane serves as a barrier between the cytosol and the inner membrane of the mitochondria, while the inner membrane has several infoldings called cristae, which contain enzymes and molecules for the, inner, or for the electron transport chain. So I'm just going to write here that its purpose is the electron transport chain. The reason why there's so many infoldings for the cristae is that the infoldings will increase the surface area available for the electron transport chain enzymes. The space in between the inner and outer membranes is called the inner membrane space, and the space inside the inner membrane is called the matrix. The pumping of, the, of protons from the mitochondrial matrix to the inner membrane space establishes a proton motive force, but that's going to be covered in detail in another video. One thing I also want to talk about is that mitochondria are semi-autonomous, meaning they have their own unique genes and more importantly, their own unique DNA called mitochondrial DNA. This, as because of this, they are examples of a concept called extranuclear inheritance, which is the transmission of genetic material independent of the nucleus. The reason for this is because scientists believe that mitochondria were originally uh, an aerobic prokaryote that was ingested by an or sorry, yeah, an, ana an anaerobic prokaryote that was ingested by an aerobic eukaryote, resulting in a symbiotic relationship. Lastly, I want to point out that just as much as the uh, mitochondria keep the cell alive, they can also cause it to die by causing a process known as apoptosis. Moving on, let's talk about the lysosome. The lysosome is a membrane-bound structure which contains hydrolytic enzymes that are capable of breaking down many different structures. These are usually substances that are ingested via endocytosis or cellular waste. The lysosomes function along with endosomes, which transport, package, and sort material traveling to and from the membrane. I want to point out that the lysosomes, if their hydrolytic enzymes leave, they will cause incredible damage to the cell and it will eventually cause the cell to rot via autolysis. 
So I guess another term I would write down here, autolysis, when the hydrolytic enzymes leave. Like with the mitochondria, they're also capable of uh, starting apoptosis, obviously with in conjunction with autolysis. The endoplasmic reticulum is next, and it's a series of interconnected membranes that are contiguous with the nuclear envelope. There are two parts to the endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes and permits the translation of proteins destined for secretion. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, secretion. Or sorry, translation of secretion proteins. Apologies for the bad uh, handwriting. I, there's not a lot of room at the bottom here. But moving on, there are all, there's also the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which lacks ribosomes and is primarily used for lipid synthesis. It's also used for detox of various substances. The, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum also transports proteins from the rough endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. So the pathway would be something like rough ER, to smooth ER, to the Golgi apparatus. Obviously, all of it originates from the nucleus. The Golgi apparatus is consisting of several stacked membranes. The materials from the ER are transferred to the Golgi in vesicles, when these vesicles are then modified by the addition of groups like carbohydrates, phosphates, and sulfates. The Golgi apparatus may also modify products through the introduction of signal sequences, which direct the delivery of the product to a specific cell location. Cellular products are repackaged into vesicles and are directed to the cell correct cellular location. If the product is meant for secretion, the secretory vesicle merges with the membrane and its contact, contents are released via exocytosis. Lastly, we have peroxisomes. These obviously contain hydrogen peroxide. One of the primary functions of peroxisomes is the breakdown of very long fatty acid chains via beta oxidation. They also participate in the synthesis of phospholipids and contain some of the enzymes involved in the pentose phosphate pathway. But that's a video for a much later time. Moving on, let's talk about the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton consists, consists of three main structures, starting with microfilaments. Microfilaments are essentially rods or solid rods of actin. The actin filaments are organized into bundles and networks and are resistant to compression and fracture. This provides protection for the cell. Actin filaments also use ATP to generate force for movement by interacting with myosin. You can see right here, this is the step-by-step -step process of how actin and myosin work together to contract the muscle. This is used in all of our skeletal muscles as well as some of our cardiac and smooth muscles. Microfilaments also play a role in cytokinesis, or the division of materials between daughter cells. During mitosis, the cleavage furrow is formed from microfilaments, which organize as a ring at the site of division between two new daughter cells. Microtubules, unlike microfilaments, are hollow polymers of tubulin. I haven't written that here, so I'll write here that this is tubulin. Oh no, I have, sorry, I was looking at intermediate filaments. But yeah, these are tubulin, are hollow, hollow polymers of tubulin, and they radiate throughout the cell, providing primary pathways for motor proteins to walk across. This is done with the materials kinesin and dynein. Cilia and flagella are modal structures, and these are composed of microtubules. The difference between cilia and flagella will be discussed later on, but essentially they formed, or they are being used, 
or the microtubules that are being used form a 9 by 2 or 9 plus 2 structure, as you see right here. Essentially, it's nine doublets of uh, microtubules followed by two in the center. Centrioles are also made of microtubules, and they're uh, found in the center of a cell called the centrosome. They're the organizing center for microtubules, and they are structured as nine triplets of microtubules with a hollow center. Now lastly, intermediate filaments. These are a diverse group of proteins, uh, which include keratin, desmin, fermentin, and lemons. They're involved in cell-to-cell cell cell adhesion and maintain the overall integrity of the cytoskeleton. Because of this, they're known to withstand an intense amount of tension. As a result, they increase the rigidity of the cell. Let's move on to prokaryotic and eukaryotic domains. Starting off with prokaryotic domains, let's talk about archaea. Archaea are single-celled organisms that are very similar to bacteria, but they contain genes and several metabolic pathways that are similar to eukarya. Historically, they were considered to be extremophiles. More, research, more, sorry, more recent research, however, demonstrates a greater variety of habitats for these organisms. Archaea are also noted for their ability to use alternate energy sources. That being said, let's talk a bit more about their similarities to eukaryotes. Eukaryotes and archaea both start translation with uh, an amino acid called methionine. I'll shorten it as MET. You should know this from the bio biochemistry series. But yeah, they started off with methionine. They also contain similar RNA polymerases and they associate DNA with histones. That being said, archaea also only have a singular uh, chromosome, single circular chromosome, and they divide by binary fission, just like bacteria. Moving on, let's talk about bacteria, which will cons consist of uh, the majority of this topic. Bacteria, they, can, uh, they contain a cell membrane and cytoplasm, and some might have flagella or, or fimbriae, which is similar to cilia. Moving on, let's talk about the shape of the bacteria. So, cosci bacteria are circular in nature. So they'll look something like this. Bacilli bacteria are rod-shaped, so they'll look like this. And spiruli are sp uh, spiral-shaped, obviously given by the nature, and they'll have a bit more of a unique shape. But yeah, that being said, let's talk a bit more about the differences between aerobes and anaerobes. Starting with obligate aerobes and anaerobes, obligate aer aerobes need oxygen to survive. So I'll write here, Oxygen, no oxygen. That being said, as I was saying before, obligate aerobes need oxygen to survive. That's how they com uh, commit to respiration. Uh, obligate anaerobes, they cannot function in the presence of oxygen. Facultative anaerobes, on the other hand, are able to tr toggle between metabolic processes. So they can use oxygen for aerobic metal... Uh, uh, sorry. They can use oxygen for aerobic metabolism if it's present, or they can switch it to anaerobic metabolism if it's not present. And lastly, aerotolerant anaerobes are unable to use oxygen for metabolism, but they are not harmed by its presence, so they can still exist in the environment. Let's move on to prokaryotic cell structure. They contain a cell wall that consists of a cell wall and a cell membrane. Together, these are known as the envelope. Sorry about that, that's a weird shape right there. I'll get rid of that too, that looks like a P or Q. All right, but now that we're talking about the cell wall, let's talk about the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative cells. If you look at the graphics here, you can see that the gram-positive cells, 
have a lar have or have several layers of peptidoglycan. That's covering it, sorry. But uh yeah, peptidoglycan. That when you st uh stain it, when you stain a, a bacteria, you will see that the uh, gram positive cells will show up very, very distinctly as they have very, very thick layers of peptidoglycan, which will show up on the stain as purple. Gram negative stains, on the other hand, or sorry, gram negative bacteria, on the other hand, only have one layer of bacteria, so they won't be showing up as purple on stains, but instead they'll show up as the color that you use to flush them out, which will usually be pink. So gram positive, for the purpose of the MCAT, I'll say that they'll come out purple. Well, gram negative will come out pink. Now let's talk about the flagella, the anatomy of the flagella. So the flagella has three main parts, the filament, the basal body, and the hook. So the hook's right here, and this right here is essentially the basal body, all of this. The filament is basically just the the part that is uh, flipped around in order for you to, or for the bacteria to be able to move, and the basal body is what controls controls all the energy and provides the mechanism for it to move. While the hook basically connects both of them together. Lastly, let's talk about the ribosome structure. You carry a Eukaryotic ribosomes are made of three or are made of two different subunits. It's a, a 40S subunit at the bottom and a 60S subunit at the top. Now, prokaryotic ribosomes are the same, only they're a bit smaller. A 30S subunit and a 20 or a 50S subunit on the top. So the way I like to write it to memorize these is I always just write them like back to back. So like if I have I'll have a prokaryotic ribosome here and a eukaryotic ribosome here. I'll write it as 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. As in 30 for the smaller, 30, 40 for the smaller subunits, 50, 60 for the larger subunits, and 70, 80 for the total ribosome. So yeah, that's all I have for you guys for prokarya. Let's move on to cellular reproduction. There are three different ways that bacteria can reproduce. We'll start off, well, this is sexual reproduction. Obviously, there is a binary, binary fission, but that's a very simple process that we don't need to cover for the MCAT. Transformation uh, is a sexual reproduction method where integration of genetic material is inserted into the host genome. Other bacteria will lyse and split, spill the contents out to the uh, host bacteria, which will then be uptaken by the uh, host bacterium. Transduction, on the other hand, is when bacteriophages will infect the DNA, inserting their DNA inside and integrating it into the genome. Lastly, the most complicated one is conjugation. Conjugation is the formation of a conjugate bridge, sorry, a conjugation bridge via a sex pilus. The F minus cells which are the recipient cells at first, so these will be labeled as F minus, become F plus cells, which are the initial donors, and the, and the, uh, sorry, the F minus cells that become the F plus cells will eventually be called HFR. Now let's talk about cellular growth phases. They go through four specific growth phases. Lag is where the no growth is occurring. Log is when there's a large amount of growth being used up or occurring, using up lots of resources in the, in the medium. Stationary is when they essentially reach their holding capacity. And then the death phase is when there's too many bacteria, not enough resources, so they must start dying off. Now, let's end this with talking about viruses. Viruses, well, well first, let's, start, let's, talk about, let's talk about the, uh, the structure of a virus. The bacteriophage is essentially the very typical virus containing a capsid, which is a protein coat, which contains the nucleic acid, which is either DNA or RNA. It also has a collar, a tail tube, and a base plate for attachment onto the bacteria or cell. 
I specifically said bacteria because bacteriophages work specifically on bacteria. Moving on to the different types of uh, RNA or different types of RNA viruses, uh, let's start off with positive sense. Positive sense viruses have genomes that can be directly translated to functional proteins by the ribosomes of the host cell. Negative sense viruses, on the other hand, are a bit more complicated, and they need a template for synthesis. For synthesis. Because of this, they need something like RNA re replicase to ensure that the complementary strand is synthesized. Retroviruses are single-strand RNA viruses that use reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase synthesizes DNA from single-stranded RNA. DNA is then integrated into the host cell genome where it's replicated and transcribed as if it was a host's own DNA. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you guys were able to learn something. We covered viruses, cellular, cellular reproduction, prokarya, eukaryotic cytoskeletons, and most importantly, the eukaryotic organelles. Like I said earlier, the nucleus is the most important part of the cell that will be tested, and the mitochondria is the second most important. So please study these in detail. That being said, that's all I have for you guys. I hope you guys learned something useful today. Uh, good luck with the rest of your day and happy studying.